Introduction. Eugene V Debs, 1855 to 1926, stands as one of the most influential figures in American labor history, staunchly advocating for the rights of workers and championing social justice. Emerging as a significant leader in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Debs played a pivotal role in organizing and leading numerous strikes, which became significant milestones in labor rights advocacy. These efforts, marked by resilience and determination, were instrumental in highlighting the plight of the American working class and challenging the established norms of labor exploitation. Debs' tireless dedication to workers' rights and social equality still resonates today, inspiring ongoing debates on socioeconomic disparities. Debs' profound commitment to strikes was not just a manifestation of labor rights advocacy, but a reflection of his broader vision for social and economic equity. His leadership in the Pullman strike of 1894 and his association with the industrial workers of the world exemplified his unrelenting pursuit of a more equitable society. Despite facing imprisonment and societal resistance, Debs continued to be a vocal critic of capitalism and a proponent of socialism, thereby leaving an indelible mark on American political thought. May we have a good poem, please? Upon a stage of strife and toil arose Eugene V Debs, voice against the woes. In fervent fight for rights of those who strain, his words did echo, breaking labor's chain. Against the tide of greed and power's might, he stood unwavering, a beacon bright. Through strikes and battles, tirelessly he fought, for justice, equity, and change he sought. In prison's grasp, his spirit never broke, his fiery ideals through the silence spoke. A champion for workers in their plight, he carved a path toward the equal light. In history's annals, Deb's name is writ, a tireless warrior, his flame still lit. Prefaced by Timon Peacelove and the reactionaries at Timpak Samuel. Greetings, friends, thinkers, and fellow seekers of truth. I am Timon Peacelove, and we, the reactionaries at Timpak Samuel, are thrilled to bring you a closer look at the life and works of Eugene V Debs, a man whose principles and actions continue to ignite discussions and reflections. In this exploration, we will delve into the depths of Debs' commitment to strikes as a powerful tool for change, shedding light on the historical context and the enduring relevance of his endeavors. In our pursuit, we aspire to foster a balanced dialogue, inviting viewers to reflect on the varying perspectives surrounding Debs' legacy. We aim to unearth the complexities of his ideals, the challenges he encountered, and the impact he made in shaping labor movements. As we navigate through the multifaceted narrative of Debs' journey, we encourage you to join us with an open mind, ready to question, learn, and, perhaps, reshape your understanding of this pivotal figure in American history. Together, let us embark on this enlightening journey, exploring the intersections of labor, society, and political thought as we unravel the enduring legacy of Eugene V Debs and his unyielding quest for social justice. Join us, share your thoughts, and be a part of the conversation that continues to shape our collective narrative on equity, rights, and the human condition. Now, let it commence. Federation, The Lesson of the Great Strike by Eugene V Debs, published in Locomotive Fireman's Magazine, Volume 12, Number 4, April 1888, pp. 246-248. A railroad strike creates intense and widespread excitement and alarm. It is not surprising. The railroads of the country, now estimated at 148,000 miles of track and costing $8 billion, or are capitalized at that amount, practically the same thing, constitute the highways of traffic and transportation, and any serious disturbance in their operation produces at once incalculable calamities. It dwarfs the subject to discuss the various systems, since all roads, by their connection, constitute one great system, and any serious disturbance anywhere is more or less disastrous everywhere. Governor John Martin of Kansas is credited with saying all the commercial and industrial pursuits of the people have been adjusted to the carrying trade of the railways. Block the wheels of the Kansas railways for one week and nine-tenths of all the mills and factories of the state would lie compelled to close. Block them for three weeks, and every commercial and agricultural pursuit in Kansas would be paralyzed. What is true of Kansas is equally true of every other state in the Union. Such self-evident truths do not demand discussion. As a consequence, the first lesson taught by the Great Strike is that the whole people are profoundly interested in all that pertains to its inception and progress as they will be in the final results of the disturbance. 
It may be assumed, we think, that the great body of the people, being aroused by the great strike, will insist upon knowing definitely the causes which led up to it, and he, since their interests are jeopardized, will, as they have a right to do, discuss remedies that shall in the future act as guarantees against disagreements which in their effect are fatal to the prosperity of the country. And we do not hesitate to assert our belief that the people will favour such remedies only as will do full justice to the parties immediately involved in the controversy, viz. employer and employee. But the faith of the people must, of necessity, be largely dependent upon the information which the people have relating to matters in dispute. Hence, the great strike emphasises the importance of furnishing the people with the facts, clear-cut and bedrock. But the great strike has taught the strikers the lesson that the press cannot be relied upon to furnish such information. It is always found in alliance with corporate interests and opposed to strikers. We speak of the rule and not of the exceptions, and this fact brings into bold prominence another lesson taught by the great strike. It is this, if corporations and the press confederate to overwhelm workingmen when they demand redress for grievances, they too must federate to enforce their rights which corporations deny them when demands are made in a becoming manner. It goes without saying that there exists a strong bond of union between railroad corporations when the demands of their employees are for an equitable share of the wealth they create, the theory being that in the matter of wages corporations shall always determine the rate, regardless of the rights and interests of the wage worker, and instances are rare in which, as a right, employees have been consulted. And if a case can be found in which wages are even approximately fair, it will be discovered upon investigation to be the result, if not of a stoke, of latent forces which could have been called into operation if the demand had been ignored. Another lesson taught by the Great Strike, and one which should be profoundly studied by railroad employees, is that since railroad corporations federate, coalesce, when any effort is made to advance wages on the part of any one of the brotherhoods of railroad workers, a similar federation is indispensable on the part of all the brotherhoods when, as a last resort, a strike is ordered. As, in the one case, it is found that the corporations federate against the workers, it becomes supreme folly to expect success if one brotherhood is left to fight the battle single-handed. And the contest invites federation from the fact that the question of fair, equitable pay is alike vital to all. It is the question of labour versus corporate power and injustice, and in this every worker is equally interested. It is a question in which the interest of one is the interest of all. If wage men doubt the proposition, so far as they are concerned, they have only to contemplate the fact that corporations act upon that principle, which has been given special. Emphasis since the CBMQ strike, which we denominate the Great Strike, was inaugurated. If strength is found in unity, it needs no argument to prove that weakness is in alliance with division, and this fact being fully comprehended by corporations, it will be well for all the brotherhoods of railroad workers to give it due consideration, and if, upon reflection, it is found, as it surely will be found, that success lies in federation, no time should be lost in forming an alliance, offensive and defensive, by virtue of which justice would be secured and strikes would at once and forever disappear. We deem it prudent to suggest that preliminary to such a federation of brotherhood railroad workers there must be a recognition of mutual interest, all brotherhoods must stand on the same plane. The idea of superiority and inferiority must be dismissed. The motto must be, united we stand, divided we fall. For purposes of protection the throttle and the scoop, the switch, and the brake must be in close alliance and equally firm and defined, and when corporations see this federation accomplished no strike will occur, because a strike under such circumstances would mean an immediate cessation of railroad transportation on the line or system where it occurred. Instead of a strike there would be arbitration, a patient consideration of grievances when presented, and a prompt application of remedies when found. Of all the lessons taught by the great strike, not one, as we view the situation, is of more importance than the one which emphasizes the wisdom of a compact federation of engineers, firemen, switchmen, and brakemen for mutual protection will and their rights and interests are involved, because the question of honest pay for honest work is a supreme question in which all are involved, and here we repeat that the wisdom of such a federation cannot be questioned by railroad corporations, since they federate for mutual protection against labor when it complains of unjust treatment at their hands. We are not unmindful of the fact that strikes of railroad employees are disastrous. We need not to be reminded of their cost in some totals of dollars, nor the sufferings they entail upon those who, to secure justice at the hands of corporations, accept the sacrifice with heroic devotion to right. 
we would have a settlement of every dispute without a resort to extreme measures. We would have employer and employee meet amicably and in a spirit of fairness adjust every grievance. We would have employers recognize their employees as men, upon whom vast and exacting responsibilities devolve, and without whose services railroad operations would cease as certainly as if by a decree of Jehovah. Nor would we have employees demand more than their rights, tested by any standard which might be accepted as embodying approximate justice, but we would have employees consulted in all such matters and their consent obtained, because, while recognizing to the fullest extent the power and value of capital in carrying forward the enterprises of the day, we know that it is inert and powerless until vitalized and set in motion by labor. Viewing the subject from such standpoints, we venture the prediction that the day is near at hand when the brotherhoods of railroad employees will federate for mutual protection, and we further predict that when such a federation is perfected, railroad strikes will be numbered among things of the past. It will not be a federation against capital, but, on the contrary, a federation seeking a closer alliance with capital, an alliance which will be just to all parties concerned, an alliance in which arbitration, mutual concessions, shall take the place of strikes, a federation for the purpose of investigating for justice, of enthroning the right, which may be found if the seekers are in earnest, and which when found in established exiles jealousy and distrust and inaugurates peace, contentment and prosperity. Federation means victory for the right, and the great strike on the CB and Q has brought its necessity into such bold relief that its advocacy becomes a duty and its consummation will be fraught with incalculable blessings, not only to employees, but to employers, to society and to the whole country. The great strike by Eugene V. Debs published in Locomotive Fireman's Magazine, Volume 12, Number 5, May 1888, pp. 322-324, in the April magazine, we had an article captioned, The CB&Q Strike, which we designated as the Great Strike. One in closing the article we said, as we write the strike is still on, and no one can predict final results, but we deem it prudent to say that the loyalty of the men to honest conviction demands the highest praise. Prudent, conservative, and anxious to work, they realized that the officials of the CBMQ were studiously and steadfastly denying them honest pay for honest work, belittling them as compared with employees on other roads and denying them consideration when the grievances were set forth in a way demanding prompt and patient consideration. Under such circumstances, the men behaved like veterans under fire. Their rights and their manhood were at stake, and they would yield nothing that could, by any possible construction, be regarded as conceding what was justly the due, and whatever may be the final result, the men will have maintained their integrity and will have demonstrated that their courage was equal to their convictions. More than a month has elapsed since the strike was inaugurated. It is still on, nor are there any indications of its immediate termination. On the contrary, the strike is daily developing new phases and is steadily extending to other roads. Manifestly, we were not mistaken in referring to the strike as the Great Strike, such as to be its position in the history of the labor troubles of the times, and it is eminently becoming and important that working men shall fully understand the strike from inception to triumph or defeat. And here, let it be said that the locomotive engineers and firemen originally involved in the strike have at no time under one, the CB&Q strike, Locomotive Firemen's Magazine, Volume 12, Number 4, April 1888, pp. 242-246, tomated the gravity of the situation. They knew that grievances were just and upon general principles they had a right to believe that the officials of the CB&Q would deal justly by them. In a manly way, they presented the grievances. They had patiently borne the wrongs complained of for years. They were competent and faithful men. They had proven themselves worthy of the confidence of their employer. They believed the grievances well-founded in fact, and the demands just. In presenting the grievances, and in demanding remedies, there was no precipitation. Every move was the result of calculating deliberation. Repulse did not dishearten them. They made concessions and exhausted expedients, and struck only when every consideration of right, justice, honor, and manhood impelled them to take the step. Such reflections may be deemed unnecessary, but they are bedrock facts in the history of the strike and should be vivid in the mind of every engineer and fireman in the country. There must be no question relating to the absolute justice of the strike. 
If the men who went out were wrong, if the grievances were unworthy of consideration, equivalent to no grievance at all, no amount of writing can make the strike anything but a stupendous mistake. But, if the grievances were well founded, if the demands of the men were just and equitable, then the strike dignifies the men who are engaged in it, and the more stubborn their resistance of wrong, the more defined their attitude, and the greater their sacrifices in the cause of right, the more they expand to the full stature of men and citizens, and the more they are entitled to the sympathy and support of the brotherhoods, whose principles they maintain. It is a fact worthy of note and reflection that the press, as a general proposition, has antagonized the rights and interests of the engineers and firemen, while it has championed the course pursued by the officials of the CBMQ. This is not a surprise, since, on all occasions the press takes the side of the corporation when labor complains of injustice. There are honorable exceptions, but the rule is as we have stated it, and hence we have heard through the press from the very first that the CBMQ had won the fight, and that business on their system was proceeding smoothly, that trains were running regularly, and that the places of the strikers had been filled, and thus on to the end of the chapter of statements totally devoid of truth, sent broadcast over the country to poison the public mind against the men, and to aid the corporation to perfect its nefarious policy of injustice to men, the length and breadth, the height and depth of whose offending was the demand for a fair day's wages for a fair day's work. But there is a phase of this press championship of the corporation, and this disgraceful antagonism of working men, which defies exaggeration. The position taken by the press is scarcely less than criminal. It would have the public believe that the men who have taken the places of the strikers, on the CBMQ, are competent and trustworthy, when the statement is known to be notoriously false, the CBMQ having been driven to the direst extremity to obtain men at all, and having accepted the services of engineers notoriously unqualified, have placed the travelling public in peril by the employment of such characters. It is well known that the CBMQ system has paid already a terrible penalty in the loss of business and the wreckage of rolling stock for its flagrant injustice to its former employees. Its interests in every department have suffered. Its stock is without market value, and its earnings are not sufficient to pay expenses. It is today a financial wreck, and its chief officials have been placed upon record in court proceedings, showing them to be capable of business methods characteristic of freebooters. The arraignment of the CBMQ by the general manager of the Rock Island Road, Mr. E. St. John, has exposed the knavish schemes of its officials, and placed upon record the fact that they favoured a strike to obscure a conspiracy, the purpose of which was, not only to injure competing minds, but to repress and defraud their employees. Nothing could be more preposterous than to assert the triumph of the CBMQ. It has not been at any time, since the engineers and firemen left its service, more demoralised than at present. It is losing money by the millions. Its officials are losing character and credit. In their frantic efforts to maintain a semblance of business, they are forced to resort to deception and falsehood. Their engines are being wrecked, their traffic has fallen off, the cars are sidetracked, and ruin stares them in the face. To add to the embarrassments of the CBMQ, the switchmen, whose labours, always arduous and dangerous, are made indefinitely more perilous by incompetent engineers, refuse to continue in its employment. They refuse to work for a corporation which had less regard for the safety of its men than it exhibited for the security of mules, and they demanded that competent men should be employed, thereby reducing the chances of death and mutilation. The officials of the CBMQ in refusing the reasonable request of their switchmen evinced a heartless brutality strictly in consonance with their treatment of engineers and firemen. As we write the strike is still on. It is as vigorous and as defiant as on the 27th day of February, 1888, when it began, notwithstanding the vaporing declarations of a subsidized press, that the engineers and firemen have been vanquished. We are not unmindful of the strength of corporations, nor of the fact that the wrong has all too often triumphed over the right, and it may be that in the struggle with the CBMQ, in alliance with other powerful corporations and aided by the influence of a venal press, working men will be required to retire from the contest, to nurse their misfortunes with such philosophical composure as they can command, but that time has not yet come, nor is it, we conjecture in the near future. In the desperate game the CBMQ has chosen to play, it does not hold all the winning cards. In the battle now being waged, it does not command all the strategic positions. The edict has gone forth that CBMQ cars must be isolated. The system is to be hedged about by a power which, when fully exerted, will leave it alone in its moral and financial ruin.
Even now, the system so strong and arrogant that was unmindful of the penalties which sooner or later overtake prosperity based upon perfidy, is reading the handwriting of the skeleton finger of fate on the walls of its depots and the dead walls along its lines. It is now, like the boy passing the graveyard, whistling to keep up its courage. Its language is that of bravado, and while a parasitic press proclaims victory for the road, the facts show that decay and demoralization have seized upon its business and property and that death is inevitable if it does not speedily change its policy. On the other hand, the engineers and firemen, convinced of the righteousness of their cause, were never more confident. From Canada to Mexico, from the Pine Tree State to the Golden Gate, from the Inland Seas to the Gulf, from ocean to ocean, 50,000 Brotherhood men are pledged by considerations radiant with love and truth, honor and manhood, to stand by their brethren, comrades of their mystic fraternities, to work for them and to make sacrifices for them, because by so doing they are dignifying labor and magnifying justice. It may be, indeed it is probable, that the strike will spread. Who will be responsible? The engineers and firemen stand before the world saying to an arrogant corporation, pay us fair wages, and to determine what is fair wages, let there be arbitration, and we will abide the issue. Such is self-evidently fair, honorable, and just to all parties. Heaven could offer nothing more in consonance with uprightness. Why is it that the press does not see the righteousness of such a demand? Why is it that other corporations whose interests are involved do not say to the CBMQ, be just? To do an act of simple justice to men, citizens, not serfs, would settle the trouble in an hour. To withhold this act of justice is replete with peril, and the responsibility, by a decree which will be irrevocable, will rest upon those who prefer ruin to the reign of right. Other brotherhoods of working men, besides engineers and firemen, are coming to the rescue. They see that the strike involves a principle vital to their own welfare as men and brotherhoods, and in this voluntary federation for the good of all, there is moral grandeur that defies hyperbole. We profess no powers of prophecy, we are not the student of vagaries, but we have a right to discuss the signs of the times, we have a right to anticipate coming events, and exercising this right, we indulge the conviction that the strikers will win the fight, and at any rate whatever may be the outcome, we realize that the brotherhoods, whatever may be lost or won, will never have cause for reproach that they put forth their strength in a cause which not only involved their own welfare, but the best interests of society. Call it the American Railway Union, the new organization will endeavor to abandon strike methods published in Chicago Daily Tribune Volume 52, Number 41, February 10, 1893, PG 3. The American Railway Union was the name under which the railway men in session at the Leland Hotel, Chicago, organized yesterday, February 9, 1893. They met at 10 a.m. with George W. Howard in the chair and S. Kelly Hur as secretary. Twenty-four names responded to roll call. The Committee on Constitution and Principles asked further time. The chairman, Howard, said, we should proceed slowly. We want to lay the foundations of the order on correct lines. It will require at least a month to properly do the work. The committee consists of E.V. Debs, L.W. Rogers, and S. Kellyher. A committee was appointed to secure and furnish headquarters in Chicago. It was decided not to effect a permanent organization until the next meeting, which will be called by Chairman Howard in Chicago within a month. At that meeting, the Committee on Constitution, as well as minor committees, will report, permanent organization will be effected, the headquarters will be opened, and the union will begin active work, organizers will be at once put on the roads, the journal of the union will begin publication, and the work of organization will be pushed as rapidly as possible. In the meantime, lodges will be instituted. The conference adjourned at 2 p.m. yesterday. The rest of the afternoon was given up to a reception to the scores of railroad employees of Chicago and elsewhere who dropped in at the Leland to ask the promoters of the new order further details as to the plan of organizer Tian. These visitors were about equally divided between members and non-members of existing unions. Eugene V. Debs, one of the leading spirits of the new movement, said, We have made a start. We antagonize no one. We will organize closely for protection. We have asked for legislative reforms in the various states in matters affecting the interests of railway employees. They have been refused and laughed or bought out of the legislatures. By a compact union, we can make our voice heard in state capitals. Look at the number of men killed annually while on duty in our business whose lives could be saved if we could secure even humane legislation in our behalf. 
we will strip our union of the secrecy which has so greatly retarded many labor unions. We will invite the press to hear us talk of our grievances and proposed reforms. Our cause is just. We have nothing to fear from an open discussion of our condition. We propose to conduct the union on simple business principles, keep expenses down, charge small dues, have no beneficiary features, and live simply for mutual protection and the bettering of the condition of all our members. Strikes as labour weapons are obsolete. We have advanced to a higher scale. With the Australian ballot system and a good, clean, compact organisation, we have reason to hope for magnificent results from the American Railway Union. The commercial and political considerations involved in sympathetic railroad strikes by Eugene V. Debs published in Locomotive Fireman's Magazine, Volume 17, Number 12, December 1893, pp. 987 to 990. Mr. Joseph Nimmo, Jr. is the author of a pamphlet in which he discusses the subject indicated in the caption we have reproduced from his pamphlet. Mr. Nimmo was statistician of the United States Treasury Department for many years, and for what we know to the contrary, may still be occupying that responsible position. Mr. Nimmo deems it advisable to come to the rescue of messes. Taft and Ricks, the United States judges whose judicial jugglery with the law in the case of men versus the corporation in the Toledo, Ann Arbor and North Michigan Railroad was such as to remind one of cuttlefish tactics, so that when they had exploited their erudition the case became utterly incomprehensible to lawyers, to say nothing of laymen. It was very kind in Mr. Nimmo to come to the rescue of the judges for the purpose of rendering clear what was exceedingly inky, and if he has not succeeded in his self-imposed task, he has by the exhibition of intentions, doubtless secured a free railroad pass, and possibly more substantial rewards from railroad corporations, for his sympathetic contribution. Mr. Nimmo deplores sympathetic railroad strikes. In the fierce struggle which workingmen experience to obtain and maintain their rights against the rapacity of corporations, Mr. Nimmo would eliminate all indication of sympathy, which means fellow feeling, an agreement of inclinations, kindness towards one who suffers wrong and injustice, and which embodies to the fullest extent the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have others do unto you. To that sort of flat doodle Mr. Nimmo is opposed with all the heart he has at command. Mr. Nimmo, and men of his ilk, explode with the force of a shooting cracker when dealing with the sacredness of commerce, particularly interstate commerce, the sum total of which he estimates at $40 billion a year. It is to him what Nebuchadnezzar's golden image was which he set up and then demanded that nations and tribes and tongues should fall down and worship, and in the frenzy of his idolatry and self-importance, human rights were totally obscured. Mr. Nimmo lifts up his voice and shouts, Commerce! Commerce! corporation, law, he would have trains move though every man employed in the work should be ground to powder by the wheels of commerce. Mr. Nimmo admits, the right of the employees of railroad companies to organize for their mutual advancement as a class, but this protection must not include the slightest inconvenience to commerce. If, however, the corporation strikes for protection against employees and discharges a hundred or more of them, neither Mr. Nimmo messes. Taft and Ricks, nor any other free pass advocate of justice, utters so much as one word in regard to the inconvenience of commerce. Their fees do not invite to such argumentative gymnastics. There is no butter on such cornbread. But, when it comes to the railroad employee, then law, logic and lucre mingle and flow together in a resistless tide. It is the one tide in the affairs of the corporation that leads on to fortune, and court and corporation straddle it while the entire tribe of Nimmo's shout as the pageant passes along and distributes nickels for their support. Mr. Nimmo quotes the law to show how the railroads of the country are tied together endwise and the tremendous obligations imposed upon them by statute, and then endeavour to show their messes. Taft and Ricks by the decisions have pretty effectually welded the railroad employee to their interstate tracks and machines. Have they done it? That is the real question before the country. All else is quite immaterial. The question is going to the Supreme Court of the nation. It is vital. It is far-reaching. In some of its aspects, it is terrible. Mr. Nimmo thinks there is a vital, political question involved, in which he is right. Nothing less than the enslavement of men by statute to guard commerce to protect the corporation. It is a question, says Mr. Nimmo, which involves the integrity of our political institutions. What is this overshadowing question which startles Mr. Nimmo? 
this, a sympathetic strike of railroad employees. And Mr. Nimmo says, this is no exaggeration, for the power to stop every wheel on the great trunk lines of the country, time and time again asserted, is evidently a much more strenuous exercise of power than that which the national government has ever seen fit to exercise under the constitutional authority of regulating commerce among the states. If then it is determined by the supreme judicial power of the nation that the law ties men to the machine, makes them a part of the rowing stock of the corporation, strikes down one inalienable right of the citizen, it may come, and it should come as a last resort, to maintain the rights of citizens, to stop every wheel on the great trunk lines of the country. But before such a calamity befalls the country, Congress will be required to banish such an infamous law from the statute books of the nation, and it will be done. Mr. Nimmo, if he has the leisure, should write another pamphlet and introduce his fancies, indicative of the task which would be performed of reducing to bondage the railroad employees of the country, and further, to intimate the ways and means dy which the sympathy one workingman has for another may be successfully crushed out. Mr. Nimmo proceeds to discuss concrete facts which have an important bearing upon the matter, to which he refers. He says, there are employed on the railroads of the United States a hon 35,000 locomotive engineers and 36,000 firemen, in all about 71,000. The total number of persons employed in gainful occupations in the United States is about 21 million. The total population of the United States is now about 65 million. The total number of persons employed as locomotive engineers and firemen therefore constitutes about the 1 300th part of 1% of the persons employed in the United States in gainful occupations, and about 1 900th part of 1% of the total population of the country. The wages paid annually to locomotive engineers and firemen in the United States amount to not far from $76.5 million, this being about 1 15th of the total disbursements of all kinds by railroad companies annually. The value of the railroad property of the country is not far from $10 billion. The value of the commodities transported annually on the railroads of the country exceeds $40 billion. The aggregate sum paid annually in wages to locomotive engineers and firemen amounts, therefore, to only one-fifth of one percent of the total annual value of the internal commerce of the country. There are transported on the railroads of the United States about 530 million passengers annually. During the year ended June 30, 1890, each passenger locomotive engine hauled 58,735 passengers. The foregoing serves an important purpose in the discussion, since but for the railroad employees, not a wheel would turn and the entire establishment would go to ruin, and since the employees play such an important part, are those who seek to repress and degrade them entitled to more consideration than any other class of tyrants may claim. We are quite willing that Mr. Nimmo should here have a hearing as to his estimate of locomotive engineers and firemen. He says, the locomotive engineers of the United States are engaged in an exceedingly important occupation, involving peril, and full of heroic fascination. They perform an essential function in the conduct of the grandest system of transportation ever seen on this planet, the American Railroad System, a vast and complex organization formed by the coordination of many elements, personal, commercial, financial, and mechanical, and sustaining vitally important relations to the commercial and social life of the nation. This system of transportation, with its multiform relationships, constitutes the business environment of the locomotive engineers and firemen of the country, an environment with which they must live in harmony in order to secure their own well-being, and in order that they may be useful in the great work of internal commerce. This is beyond all question. Read the foregoing and then ask if it is to be presumed that the men Mr. Nimmo eulogizes are likely to submit without resistance to statutes or decisions which reduces them to degrading vassalage that commerce may be prosperous among the states. The men who work on railroads are the friends of commerce, progress and prosperity, quite as devoted and sincere as an average judge, corporation, president, bondholder, merchant, princely manufacturer, or even Mr. Nimmo himself, but they do not propose to be enslaved, nor will oceans of panegyrical adulations quiet them while judges of the Taft and Rick style or any other model are applying the branding iron. This country has had quite enough of slavery, and if the shackles struck from the limbs of Negroes are to be riveted by court decrees upon the limbs of white men, then there will be trouble, which will be Vesuvian volcano compared to an ordinary smokestack. Enslaving statutes will not stand, decisions of judges will not stand the onset. 
But the form of the American government, as the fathers made it, will not pass away in the struggle, not much, but it will be wrested from the grasp of plutocrats and their aiders and abettors, and with its pristine beauty and glory reinstated it will stand, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and the Nimmo's, Taft's, and Rick's may as well take notice. Edited with footnotes by Tim Davenport, 1000 Flowers Publishing, Corvallis, OR June 2017, non-commercial reproduction permitted. First edition Joseph N. Nimmo Jr., 1831-1909, was a civil engineer turned economist who was head of the U.S. government's Bureau of Statistics for 10 years. Joseph Nimmo, the commercial and political considerations involved in sympathetic railroad strikes. Washington, D.C., N.P., 1893. William Howard Taft, 1857-1930, is best known as the 27th President of the United States. A former Ohio State Judge, Taft was appointed to the Sixth Circuit of the U.S. Court of Appeals in March 1892 by President Benjamin Harrison. Augustus J. Ricks, 1843-1906, was appointed to the U.S. Court for the Northern District of Ohio in July 1889 by President Benjamin Harrison. Political Lessons of the Pullman Strike by Eugene V. Debs published as Political Lessons in Railway Times, Volume 2, No. 5, March 1, 1895, P.G. 1. The lessons taught by what is known as the Pullman Strike are manifold. They are industrial, financial, and commercial lessons, and naturally, as the component elements of air or water, lend and constitute a political lesson which all men of intelligence are now studying with profound solicitude. Contemplating the strike from such a point of observation, it may be regarded as a national blessing rather than a national calamity. It may not be impossible to discuss political questions without reference to political parties, but such is not the American habit. Political parties are the natural result of free speech, and while there is even a remnant of this right remaining in the country, men will divide and group themselves into parties. To deprecate political parties involves hostility to free speech and the abandonment of all hope of reform. The Pullman strike has aroused national solicitude. It has vividly defined political issues. If, on the one hand, it has made prominent the power of the government by the use of such instrumentalities as its courts and armies, it has on the other hand given, if possible, more conspicuousness to conditions, which injunctions, however despotic, and bullets, however quieting, cannot, in the nature of things, improve, but which, under the application of such Russianized methods, must proceed continually from bad to worse, until revolution rescues free institutions from the grasp of corporate anarchism, or they lie crushed and dead in the python coils of a triumph and despotism. I do not overcolor the situation. As I write, national scorn is concentrated upon Congress, where the Sugar Trust and the Whiskey Trust, by the persuasive power of money, humiliated the American people in the presence of the nations, and now we behold the party responsible for the abandonment of right, truth, justice, and all things of good report among men, with an impudence sufficiently brazen to make the devil himself blush for what the president terms perfidious dereliction of duty, asking the American people to renew its lease of power. In doing this, the party that won eternal infamy by yielding to the power of the Sugar Trust and the Whiskey Trust arraigns the other great party for having been guilty of legislating in the interests of trusts and corporations for more than 30 years and against the interests of the people, and what is more important still, it introduces irrefutable testimony to sustain the indictment. The Pullman strike has, in connection with other agencies, served the important purpose of attracting attention to chronic delinquencies of the two old parties, and is impressing upon the mind of multiplied thousands of voters the necessity for another political party. Afro-American chattel slavery was the national curse and crime which a half-century ago burned into the American conscience the necessity for a new party. Agitators, who fanned the divine spark into a flame, were pelted with storms of vulgar epithets, escurrility, and maledictions, to the extent of the resources of the English language. They were confronted with mobs, driven from platforms, and free speech was cloven down. The courts were invoked and decisions rendered which, even yet, are regarded as monumental infamies, and all along those gloomy years the government, in all of its departments, kept high advanced the national ensign symbolizing liberty, but at the same time floating above slave pens and slave blocks, slave whips and shackles, making the United States darker than the dark continent, and extorting the cry, haul down the flaunting lie. The agitation proceeded. 
The demand for a new party became yearly more pronounced. The signal fires of reform burned fiercer and higher. Men rallied to the new standard and the new party, which had its origin in agitation, mobs, riots, and death, and finally overwhelmed all opposition and in 1860, after 40 years of struggle, was victorious, and, later on, amidst the smoke and carnage of war, and at a fearful cost of life and money, seven million slaves stood forth unfettered and free, and the stars and stripes for the first time in 86 years floated over a land in which there were no slaves. Since that period of vanquishing wrong and the enthronement of the right, a system of wage slavery has been introduced. Warmed into life in the womb of greed, and fostered by laws and legislation as unholy as that which legalized slave stealing and the breeding of human beings, like swine, for the market, it has gained power and prestige until wage slaves, under the domination of the money power, acting through trusts, syndicates, corporations, and monopoly land stealing, capitalization, railroad wrecking, bribery, and corruption, define proper characterization, we are confronted with conditions bearing the impress of pianism, infinitely more alarming than was African slave in its darkest days. Under such circumstances, what, I ask, is more natural, within the entire realm of human duties, than that wage men should organize, agitate, and strike for their rights. The Pullman strike, confessedly more far-reaching in its sweep and significance than any other struggle the continent has witnessed, will pass into history as having been the one thing needful to arouse the nation to the perils which the money power has spawned upon the country. The American Railway Union, having from the first discountenanced violence and deplored the destruction of property may, I think, suggest that the Pullman strike, notwithstanding such unfortunate features, has its compensations. No one will deny that the Pullman strike has aroused the government from its stupor to a sense of its obligations to ascertain the cause of the phenomenal disturbance, and the work of investigation, once begun, the hope and the belief may be entertained that it will be prosecuted until foundation infamies are discovered and dragged forth for the enlightenment of those who, in the absence of such information, find it profitable to reply the epithet of anarchist to those whose courage created the necessity for investigation, which, if honest and thorough, as indications warrant, the the inevitable conclusion will be reached that men who strike against starvation wages and for the protection of those who are dependent upon them against corporate and plutocratic spoliation represent the true American spirit and courage, which, once destroyed by the rapacity of heartless employers of the Pullman strike, aided by United States courts and United States troops, would foreshadow calamities which it would be difficult to exaggerate. If, through the agencies of investigation and legislation, the curse of wage slavery disappears, or is so modified as to produce greater contentment in the armies of labor, fruitful of the hope that at no distant day full emancipation shall be secured by wise legislation, the American Railway Union will expand to colossal proportions of organized philanthropy such as the ages have not witnessed, because the lesson it will have taught legislators and courts, presidents and governors, and men in command of military machines is that the majesty of truth and justice rather than the the tyranny of injunctions, aided by the persuasive power of powder, must preserve our free institutions if they are to be perpetuated. Never since the colonies were rescued from the grasp of King George has man's capacity for self-government been so confessedly on trial as in these closing years of the century. Thoughtful Americans are adopting the views expressed by Lord Macaulay that Americans are not qualified to perpetuate the government the fathers founded. On every hand is heard applause when a court, in the spirit of a czar, lays its hands upon workingmen, and as whim may dictate, deprives the victims of its authority of property and liberty, and rejoicings, rising to peens, are heard when in obedience to military commands wage men demonstrate, as they fall bleeding and gasping, that ours is a strong government. Macaulay thought that we should be able to preserve a government and civilization, but that liberty would be sacrificed. Under the reign of the two great parties that have dominated the government, many years will not be required to fulfill Macaulay's prophecy. Indeed, only a semblance of liberty remains when courts and the military put forth their unrestrained power. Such facts are taught by the lesson of the Pullman strike, but, fortunately, still other lessons are inculcated, among which is the lesson that the time has come for a new party to take the reins of government and bring it back to pristine purity, and that now is the time for workingmen and all who are animated by the spirit of patriotic devotion to liberty to unify to perpetuate the liberties of the people, to the end that government by the people, of the people, and for the people, may not perish from the earth. Eugene V Debs Strike Lessons, a dispassionate review of the Great Leadville Struggle, April 5, 1897, Terre Haute, Indiana, April 5, 1897. The strike of the miners in the Leadville district has passed into history. 
It was one of the longest and most bitterly contested battles ever fought between organized labor and organized capital. Beginning June 19, 1896, and continuing until March 9, 1897, the strike extended over a period of eight months and 18 days. It is a tried declaration that a strike is a war. This is more or less true of all strikes, but it applies with peculiar force to the prolonged strike of the Leadville miners. It was, indeed, war on both sides, so regarded it and made preparations accordingly. There are those who regard all strikes as unmixed evils. They are forever telling us about the losses entailed, the damage that has been done, the bitterness that has been aroused, and so on to the end of the chapter. It is admitted that in the great labor strikes of the past many things occurred that were to be deplored, but it is safe to declare that there was not one but had its good results. And so, whatever there may be to regret in connection with the Leadville strike, it is certain to be productive of good and to have its lessons for those who are capable of profiting by observation and experience. At the time of the strike, there were about 2,600 members in the local union, or about 97% of all the miners employed in the district. It will thus be observed that the miners were what may be called thoroughly organized, and it must be said to their credit that from first to last, through all the long and weary months, through good and evil report, they stood together, true to their organization, and only an insignificant number returned to work while the strike was in progress. Having been upon the ground, and having had the opportunity of meeting and talking with these men, I speak advisedly when I say that they were impelled by pure and honest motives, and that they conscientiously believed they were in the right, and this no doubt accounts for the facts that there were scarcely any deserters from the ranks, and that the strike lasted so long a time. What was the cause of the strike, and were the men justified in declaring it? In answering this question, as in all other matters which I shall discuss in these articles, one it will be my purpose to be fair and to state facts. I quote as follows from the official report of the Joint Special Legislative Committee by whom a thorough investigation of the strike was made. Under the head of Grievances Before the Strike, the report says, It is in evidence that for some time, at least several months, before the strike was declared, the miners complained that a miner and his family could not live on $2.50 a day unless he worked every day, including Sundays, and that even then he would run in debt in case of sickness in his family or other temporary misfortunes, and that these complaints were communicated to the mine managers from time to time in an informal way, and the suggestion made that the scale be raised to $3. It is also in evidence that there was a fear on the part of some miners that some of the mines paying $3 per day would reduce the scale to $2.50, and two officers and a member of the union testified directly and unequivocally that one of the mine managers who was paying the $3 scale without discrimination had told them that unless the scale was raised to $3 throughout the camp, he would be compelled to reduce the scale to $2.50. This was unequivocally denied by the manager in question, but your committee is of the opinion that these officers of the union relied upon their understanding of the the interview and entertained the fear that the general scale might be reduced to $2.50. It is not my purpose to enter into details, but simply to state the salient points in the causes that led up to the strike and when the reader has these fixed in his mind he will be better able to determine whether or not the miners were justified in their subsequent action. It will hardly be disputed by fair-minded persons that a miner with a family at Leadville must live with rigid economy on a wage of $2.50 per day. Living expenses are perhaps higher than in any other city in the Union. Every item that enters into the household necessities, even to water, must be purchased. If sickness or injury falls to his lot, he is doomed. Wages cease and debt begins and a workingman in debt is no longer a free man. I am aware that there are those who declare that $2.50 per day is a good wage and that a miner and his family should be able to get along comfortably at that rate, and for their benefit I quote again from the report of the Legislative Committee. In presenting the statement of the expenses of the soldiers who were quartered at Leeville during the strike, which amounted to almost $200,000 for a period or less than five months, or about $40.00 per month, the committee says, taking the amount of the total expenses and dividing it by the number of days each man served, it appears that the average expense per man per day was $2.71. This statement, considered in connection with the matter of living expenses, is in the nature of an eye-opener. A wage of $2.50 per day of hard and hazardous work is sufficient for a miner to support his whole family, but the state is required to pay $2.71 per day to support a soldier who has nothing to do but kill time. 
In other words, it costs a soldier 21 cents per day more for his own expenses while doing nothing than is allowed a miner who works like a galley slave for the support of himself and wife and four or five children. Those who are interested in such affairs and are capable of fair play may ponder the proposition at their leisure. Then again, there was a fear on the part of the miners, as reported by the Legislative Committee, that a general reduction to $2.50 would be made if the scale of the $2.50 miners was not raised to $3. The miners declare that the statement was made by a prominent mine manager. The fact remains that the miners were under that impression. They felt that their wages were in jeopardy. Some of them knew by experience that when reduction begins it does not usually stop until the bottom is reached. They had seen coal miners in Pennsylvania gradually reduced from $4 and $5 a day to $0.65 cents per day and at last driven from the mines as if they had been wild beasts to make room for the degraded creatures who had been imported to take their places. They were anxious to maintain, if possible, an American standard of living. They desired to preserve their own self-respect and independence. They thought of home and wife and children and resolved to defend their rights by such proper means as they had at their command. They perfected their organization, appointed and authorized committees to present their complaints to the mine managers, which was done, but as the concessions that were asked were refused, the strike was declared and this by a unanimous vote of the miners in mass meeting assembled. Much has been said about the strike having been caused by the labor agitator, the demagogue, etc., but nothing could be farther from the truth. The abuse which was heaped upon President Boyce of the Western Federation of Miners and some of his associates was wholly unwarranted and grossly unjust. The miners themselves ordered the strike, and if a single one of them was opposed to it, he uttered no word to indicate his opposition. Neither have the miners at any time attempted to shirk the responsibilities of their acts. They have avowed again and again that the strike was their own voluntary action and that win or lose, they had no regret for what they had done. Published as Strike Lessons, a dispassionate review of the great struggle in the Western Minor, Volume 1, Number 26, April 10, 1897, PG. 1. The Western Minor was the official organ of the Cloud City Miners Union Number no. 33, WF of M of A, the organization which conducted the Leadville strike. 1. This was the first of six weekly articles by Debs in the Western Minor on the Leadville strike and other affairs of the Western Federation of Miners. Mine managers culpable in Leadville strike, May 10, 1897. 5. Terrot, Indiana, May 10, 1897. There is a chapter in the report of the Legislative Committee under the caption of Mine Managers Blamed, page 38, which I deem it proper to reproduce in full as follows, that the mine managers from the beginning and throughout the entire progress of the strike have shown an unjustifiable antagonism to organized labor in general, that this committee is forced to the conclusion that the proposed agreement prepared and discussed by the mine managers prior to the strike was aimed at the existence of the union in much the same way as the agreement of June 22nd, above set forth, is, that with the existence of that agreement, which was kept secret until it was produced in the course of the committee's investigations, it is not likely that any agreement or arbitration could have been arrived at before the Coronado affair, even if the union had been less arbitrary in its demands, that a failure to bring about a settlement of the difficulty since the Coronado affair, and up to the present time, is directly traceable to the unwillingness of the mine managers to treat with the union in any way that will recognize its existence, that in considering the terrible outrages committed in Leadville, the injury and financial disaster brought to a number of mine managers by reason of these outrages, and the state of terror and fear of personal violence which a number of the mine managers have suffered during the strike, there is justification on their part for their feeling of bitterness towards the union, but even that does not justify a refusal to deal with any labor organization, that in the opinion of your committee a dissolution of the present union and the organization of a new union would be an idle form, because the new union would no doubt be composed of the same members, and that therefore, if the mine managers will receive from their position not to deal with labor organizations, your committee can see no further practical reason why they should not deal with the present union, and here it is proper to stat that a number of the leading mine managers testified that they had no objection to organized labor, but on the contrary believed it was necessary for the welfare of the laborers and for the state that laborers should organize to protect their interests. The testimony of the mine managers who were examined at the hearing clearly indicated that they hold a large body of the union men in high esteem, and that they would be only too glad to give them employment. It is safe to say that reconciliation between the parties is rife and that it needs but reasonable concessions on both sides to bring it about.
This confirms what I have previously said in reference to the disruption of the miners' union having been the paramount issue. For some time, the mine owners had seen the tide of organization rising. They viewed it with no little apprehension, for they were shrewd enough to discern in the movement of power that might interfere with their plans and give them trouble. Among them were those imperious, self-willed men who would brook no interference from any source. They had always had their own way, and they had become used to issuing orders and having them implicitly obeyed. They grew furious at the very thought that they were to be dictated to as to how to run their own business, and this is what they construed the purpose of organization to be. They proposed to run their business to suit themselves, and if the wages and conditions were not satisfactory to the men, they might quit, and the sooner this was settled and understood the better for all concerned. This was the general spirit of the mine managers, although there were those who freely conceded the right of their employees to organize and to protect themselves in their rights and wages by all the lawful means that organization could provide. The attitude of the mine managers is shown in the statement of the Legislative Committee that the proposed agreement prepared and discussed by the mine managers prior to the strike was aimed at the existence of the union, and that, from the beginning and throughout the entire progress of the strike, the mine managers have shown an unjustifiable antagonism to organized labor in general, and that a failure to bring about a settlement of the difficulties since the Coronado affair, and up to the present time, is directly traceable to the unwillingness of the mine managers to treat with the union in any way that will recognize its existence. These are strong words and the responsibility for the long continuance of the strike and its attendant crime and suffering is charged wholly to the policy of the Association of Mine Managers in refusing to recognize or treat with the miners as an organized body. For, says the report, while there is justification on their part for their feeling of bitterness towards the union, even that does not justify a refusal to deal with any labor organization. While organized themselves and made secure in their position by united action, they denied the miners the same privilege and refused to recognize or treat with them in that capacity. It is urged that the reason of this was that some of the miners had committed violence and that therefore, the union had forfeited the right to be recognized as a law-abiding body. Ah, but the mine managers had taken this attitude before any violence had been committed, indeed, before the strike had been declared, so that this plea cannot be made in extenuation of their implacable hostility to the union. And it was this element in the opposition to the union that engendered most of the bitterness which, as I believe, culminated in the Coronado attack and directly or indirectly led to almost every other breach of the law. As I have previously stated, the miners who declared and carried on the strike were not infallible. That they made mistakes, some of them grave ones, cannot be questioned. In my opinion the most serious of these was in declaring the strike on such short notice, and not allowing the mine managers more time for consideration. Not that this would have prevented the strike, for this seems to have been inevitable and bound to come, but the miners would have been stronger in their position after having given the mine managers ample time and every reasonable opportunity to make the desired concession. That the men acted with undue haste is undoubtedly true, but this is readily understood by those who have attended similar meetings and know how men are swayed under the excitement incident to a recital of the grievances and the refusal of their employers to give them any satisfaction. However, as the purpose is to profit by the mistake of the past I quote as follows from the report, with which I fully agree, your committee believes that whatever the grievance of the miners may have been, the strike should not have been declared without further effort on the part of the union to bring about an adjustment, either by agreement or by arbitration, and that the strike should not have been declared without reasonable notice. The strikes of the past three years have been fraught with great suffering, but it has not been in vain. Although thousands have been forced from their homes a melancholy train to traverse climbs beyond the western main one the sacrifices have not been useless and some time they will have their compensation. In no other way can humanity reach higher elevations. Our antecedents suffered that we might enjoy and we can only bear testimony of our gratitude by doing something for those who are to come after us. Published as Deb's Pain Talk in the Western Minor, Volume. 1. Number 31, May 15, 1897, PG. 1. Copy preserved in papers of Eugene the Fifth Debs Microfilm Edition, Real 14. 1. Couplet from The Traveller, 1764, by Oliver Goldsmith, 1728 to 1774. Lesson of the Great Leadville Strike, May 31, 1897, Terre Haute, Indiana, May 31, 1897. It was a year ago this month that the Leeville strike was declared. 
A world of history has been made since that time. The experience of the Leeville miners in encountering defeat after a long and weary struggle has been shared by hundreds of thousands of other workingmen, representing nearly all the trades known to modern industry. A few years ago, before the days of great combines, labor organizations were frequently able to not only prevent reductions but to secure increases in wages. They had a powerful restraining effect upon those who sought to reduce labor, for an organized strike was at best disastrous and a thing to be avoided. It is different now. The strike is now courted on the least provocation. It gives the corporation little or no inconvenience, for all it has to do is lay back until the government, municipal, state, or federal, as the case may be, suppresses the strike and starves or jails the strikers. Capital has profited by the lessons taught by strikes, just as we want the miners at Leeville and elsewhere to do. The Leeville strike cost the miners in wages lost and in cash contributions about $1.5 million. Think of this vast sum taken from the earnings of a comparatively small body of workingmen for the purchase of idleness and all the woes that follow in its train. I write in no spirit of lamentation or regret. In writing of labor's adversities, croaking is never in order. I simply call attention to certain facts as a basis to certain conclusions. The Leadville strike, if we are stupid and unreasoning, will be a total loss, but if we are wise, it will be worth every dollar it cost many times over. The Leadville miners were as thoroughly organized as it was possible for them to be. They had the solid support of the Western Federation of Miners, the most aggressive and powerful labor organization in the West. They were able to hold their men together, practically without a break, for more than eight months, and yet they were defeated. Could they have won by holding out longer? No. Why? For several reasons. First, the Mine Owners and Managers Association was composed in the main of very rich men and they could afford to wait indefinitely. They had vast holdings elsewhere and whether the mines at Leeville were in operation for a year or two or not did not prevent them from eating three square meals a day. Theirs was simply to wait, and as long as they were enduring no privations, they could afford to do that. The temporary loss thus entailed, whatever that might amount to, is always made good by reductions of wages after the strikers are starved back into submission. Second, at the back, or in front, of the mine owners stood the state militia, the judicial guard, and all the resources of the state, and if this did not suffice, the president of the untied states, the regular army, the navy, and all the organized forces of the national government. C. Organized capital is not only supported by the government, right or wrong, it is the government. They are synonymous terms. Third, the country is swarming with idle men, miners as well as others, many of whom are verging on starvation. These are the product of the capitalistic system of production and they constitute a factor in labor strikes which decrees inevitably the defeat of labor. No labored argument is required to demonstrate that to strike under such conditions is wasteful if not criminal folly. The contest is fearfully uneven. Labor is certain to be beaten and to have to foot the bill besides. What then? Let us reason together. Suppose the miners now had the million and a half dollars the strike cost them, and suppose further that they concluded to go into the mining business themselves. Why not? Who dare say the proposition is not practicable? But it is not required to have so large a sum to begin with. A few thousand dollars would answer. The union could select three good members to supervise affairs and by judicious management, cooperative mining could soon be established and instead of miners working out their lives to enrich a few individuals they would be doing something for themselves. This would not be all there is in cooperative industry, for this, to have the proper results, must be general, but it would end wage slavery among the miners and at the same time be a link stride in the right direction. The wage system is at the foundation of labor's wrongs and these will not be righted until the system is abolished. As long as thousands of workingmen depend for employment upon the assent of an individual, they are in fetters, and the declaration of independence is a falsehood and a mockery. There is no equality of men in such a situation. One is master in all the term implies and the other are slaves. One commands and the others obey, and in these latter days, even the opportunity to yield abject obedience has become a precious privilege. This cruel, unnatural system cannot always prevail. Indeed, there are 10,000 evidences that it is even now in the grasp of dissolution. All that is required to send it tottering to its fall, never to rise again, is a little common sense among the common people.
that the Leadville miners and the Western miners in general will profit by the lessons taught by the Leadville strike, I do not doubt. Already the voices of the leaders are ringing out clearly in advocacy of more advanced ideas and more progressive policies, and when 12 months more have elapsed, the rank and file, remembering that a few mine owners had sufficient power to defy the governor, the legislature, and the entire Commonwealth of Colorado, will take an inventory of their own resources of intelligence, courage, and independence and resolve to be free men, and thus the Leadville strike will have contributed its full share toward the emancipation of labor. Published as Lesson of the Great Strike in the Western Minor, Volume 1, Number 34, June 5, 1897, PG. 1. This is the concluding installment of a series of seven weekly articles written by Debs on the Leadville, Colorado Mining Strike for the official organ of the Cloud City Miners Union Number 33, WF of M. The Great Leadville Strike, its lessons for labor, April to May 1897, won a brief statement of facts. The strike of the miners in the Leadville district has passed into history. It was one of the longest and most bitterly contested battles ever fought between organized labor and organized capital. Beginning June 19, 1896, and continuing until March 9, 1897, the strike extended over a period of eight months and 18 days. It is a trite declaration that a strike is a war. This is more or less true of all strikes, but it applies with peculiar force to the prolonged strike of the Leadville miners. It was, indeed, war on both sides so regarded it and made preparations accordingly. There are those who regard all strikes as unmixed evils. They are forever telling us about the losses entailed, the damage that has been done, the bitterness that has been aroused, and so on to the end of the chapter. It is admitted that in the great labor strikes of the past many things occurred that were to be deplored, but it is safe to declare that there was not one but had its good results. And so, whatever there may be to regret in connection with the Leadville strike, it is certain to be productive of good and to have its lessons for those who are capable of profiting by observation and experience. At the time of the strike there were about 2,600 members in the local union, or about 97% of all the miners employed in the district. It will thus be observed that the miners were what may be called thoroughly organized, and it must be said to their credit that from first to last, through all the long and weary months, through good and evil report, they stood together, true to their organization, and only an insignificant number returned to work while the strike was in progress. Having been upon the ground and having had the opportunity of meeting and talking with these men, I speak advisedly when I say that they were impelled by pure and honest motives and that they conscientiously believed they were in the right, and this no doubt accounts for the facts that there were scarcely any deserters from the ranks and that the strike lasted so long a time. What was the cause of the strike and were the men justified in declaring it? In answering this question as in all other matters which I shall discuss, it will be my purpose to be fair and to state facts. I quote as follows from the official report of the Joint Special Legislative Committee by whom a thorough investigation of the strike was made. Two under the head of grievances before the strike, the report says, it is in evidence that for some time, at least several months, before the strike was declared, the miners complained that a miner and his family could not live on $2.50 a day unless he worked every day, including Sundays, and that even then he would run in debt in case of sickness in his family or other temporary misfortunes and that these complaints were communicated to the mine managers from time to time in an informal way and the suggestion made that the scale be raised to $3. It is also in evidence that there was a fear on the part of some miners that some of the mines paying $3 per day would reduce the scale to $2.50, and two officers and a member of the union testified directly and unequivocally that one of the mine managers who was paying the $3 scale without discrimination had told them that unless the scale was raised to $3 throughout the camp, he would be compelled to reduce the scale to $2.50. This was unequivocally denied by the manager in question, but your committee is of the opinion that these officers of the union relied upon their understanding of the interview and entered attained a fear that the general scale might be reduced to $2.50. It is not my purpose to enter into details, but simply to state the salient points in the causes that led up to the strike and when the reader has these fixed in his mind he will be better able to determine whether or not the miners were justified in their subsequent action. It will hardly be disputed by fair-minded persons that a miner with a family at Leadville must live with rigid economy on a wage of $2.50 per day. Living expenses are perhaps higher than in any other city in the Union. Every item that enters into the household necessities, even to water, must be purchased. 
If sickness or injury falls to his lot, he is doomed. Wages cease and debt begins, and a workingman in debt is no longer a free man. I am aware that there are those who declare that two dollars and fifty cents per day is a good wage, and that a miner and his family should be able to get along comfortably at that rate, and for their benefit I quote again from the report of the Legislative Committee. In presenting the statement of the expenses of the soldiers who were quartered at Leadville during the strike, which amounted to almost $200,000 for a period or less than five months, or about $40,000 per month, the committee says, taking the amount of the total expenses and dividing it by the number of days each man served, it appears that the average expense per man per day was $2.71. This statement, considered in connection with the matter of living expenses, is in the nature of an eye-opener. A wage of $2.50 per day of hard and hazardous work is sufficient for a miner to support his whole family, but the state is required to pay $2.71 per day to support a soldier who has nothing to do but kill time. In other words, it costs a soldier 21 cents per day more for his own expenses while doing nothing than is allowed a miner who works like a galley slave for the support of himself and wife and four or five children. Those who are interested in such affairs and are capable of fair play may ponder the proposition at their leisure. Then again, there was a fear on the part of the miners, as reported by the Legislative Committee, that a general reduction to $2.50 would be made if the scale of the $2.50 miners was not raised to $3. The miners declare that the statement was made by a prominent mine manager. The fact remains that the miners were under that impression. They felt that their wages were in jeopardy. Some of them knew by experience that when reduction begins it does not usually stop until the bottom is reached. They had seen coal miners in Pennsylvania gradually reduced from $4 and $5 a day to $0.65 cents per day and at last driven from the mines as if they had been wild beasts to make room for the degraded creatures who had been imported to take their places. They were anxious to maintain, if possible, an American standard of living. They desired to preserve their own self-respect and independence. They thought of home and wife and children and resolved to defend their rights by such proper means as they had at their command. They perfected their organization, appointed and authorized committees to present their complaints to the mine managers, which was done, but as the concessions that were asked were refused, the strike was declared and this by a unanimous vote of the miners in mass meeting assembled. Much has been said about the strike having been caused by the labor agitator, the demagogue, etc., but nothing could be farther from the truth. The abuse which was heaped upon President Boyce of the Western Federation of Miners and some of his associates was wholly unwarranted and grossly unjust. The miners themselves ordered the strike, and if a single one of them was opposed to it, he uttered no word to indicate his opposition. Neither have the miners at any time attempted to shirk the responsibilities of their acts. They have avowed again and again that the strike was their own voluntary action and that win or lose, they had no regret for what they had done. Harmony and unity in their limits. Rarely has so large a body of men as were engaged in the Leadville strike acted in all matters with such harmony and unanimity. I was particularly struck by this feature of the strike. During all the time I was at Leadville I never heard a single complaint. Three was confidence in the leaders and mutual confidence among the members, and, feeling that they were battling in a righteous cause, they stood by one another as if bound together by hoods of steel. There is in this a beautiful lesson for those who are capable of rising above selfish and sordid influences and appreciating an exhibition of devotion to principle and fidelity to fellow man. As I write these lines, I remember the statements that were made and often repeated about the strike having been instigated by a few red-mouthed agitators. All the charge until the curtain fell upon the scene. A more flagrant falsehood was never uttered. It may be that those who made the charge repeated it so often that they themselves believed it, but there was not a scintilla of truth in it. In declaring the strike and carrying it forward, the men at all times acted for themselves. Whether the strike was wise or otherwise, the great body of the men ordered it by acclamation, and to this day not one of them can be found to avow the contrary, and to declare that it was precipitated by a few demagogues against the better judgment of the majority is to pervert the truth and insult the intelligence of men. I dwell particularly upon this point, for I know by bitter experience at what a disadvantage men are placed who are the victims of falsehood and misrepresentation at such a critical time. 
the gullible public is led to believe that the strike was wholly uncalled for, that it was incited by a few irresponsible creatures who are enemies of society and monsters of depravity, and while, perhaps, they may express some sympathy for the strikers for being so easily misled, they are almost invariably against the strike and mass all their powers to crush it, not as much as dreaming that in so doing they are simply digging their own graves. The agitator, the leader, the pathfinder has in every age paid the penalty imposed by the hosts of ignorance and superstition upon all self-sacrificing, sympathetic souls that ever sought to free and ennoble the race. Jesus Christ, the man of sorrow, was nailed to the cross, Socrates was forced to drink the fatal hemlock, Columbus was chained in a dungeon as if he were a wild beast. Were it required, the list could be made as long as the track of the human race. Years, sometimes centuries after they are dust, monuments are reared above them in grateful memory of their service to mankind. Living, they are denounced as demagogues, and dead, they are metamorphosed into demigods, and the world pays them the tribute of its profoundest reverence. This has always been the way, and we have no reason to believe that a time will come when it will be otherwise. The only reason given why this should be so is that God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. Free taking a backward look, I am persuaded that the differences between the miners and the mine managers could have been easily adjusted had there been a mutual disposition to do so. It is safe to say, in the light of the fearful proportions to which the strike expanded and the loss of life and property, the paralysis of business and the suffering and distress which followed, that if it were to do over again the strike would not be called, and it is equally safe to assume that the mine managers, as well as the miners, would go liberally halfway to prevent it. And this is one of the important lessons of the strike which it is to be hoped will be heeded by all. From the testimony brought before the Legislative Committee, and from the evidence which came to me personally, I am satisfied that the trouble had been brewing a long time, that from small beginnings the situation became more serious and the relations more strained until mutual ugliness developed and made anything like reasonable consideration of the existing differences next to impossible. The miners were organized. So were the mine managers, the latter letting the example. The mine managers, some of them at least, bought large numbers of guns and transformed their mines into forts and arsenals long before the strike was declared, while the miners made no purchase of arms until after the strike was on. The report of the Legislative Committee says, the evidence shows that at the time of the strike the manager of the Little Johnny had about 12 rifles and 5 shotguns at the mine and 150 rifles which had been purchased on a former occasion, but which were not then at the mine, that immediately after the Coronado affair he purchased an additional 150 rifles and sent the 300 to the Little Johnny mine and armed and drilled the non-union men he was importing from Missouri to work in the mine. That the Coronado mine, a year before the strike, had built an eight-foot fence of one-inch boards around its premises, which occupied an area of about 200 feet square, and that early in August the owners of the Coronado constructed inside of and about six feet from the fence, that some time before the Coronado attack, the Emmett and Ram built a fence around their premises, and the Emmett also covered the tramway crossing the road with boards containing portholes and made other preparations. In such a struggle workingmen are always at a disadvantage, and the odds are nearly always against them. They are so poor, and there are so many of them. Their surplus earnings, if any they have, have soon consumed. On the other hand, their employers are few in number and usually rich, or at least far above the immediate want line. They and their families can eat three times a day and fare comfortably for an indefinite period. They are shrewd, smart men. They meet in a small room and plan in secret and there is no danger of a paid emissary from the other side getting into their council and betraying their secrets. They understand the conditions that confront the strikers, that it is entirely a question of the stomach and that starvation will determine the contest and give them the victory and so they simply wait. How different the situation with the workingmen. There is an army of them and they are more or less poor and without resources. When their wages cease, hunger begins, and a hunger pang gnawing that his child will take the courage out of the strongest man, or drive him to desperation, one or the other. To feed and clothe and shelter this army, vastly augmented by the women and children who are dependent upon them, requires daily an enormous outlay. The organization under whose banner they are struggling responds nobly, but being composed wholly of wage laborers, most of whom have all they can do to provide for their own families, the drain severely taxes the resources of the order and soon their relief, upon which the life of the strike depends, has to be suspended and ignominious surrender is all that is left to the hapless strikers. 
Another great disadvantage is that they make no plans that are now instantly communicated to the other side. They have got to take the whole big crowd into their confidence and they might as well hold their meetings on the public square, for the spies, spotters, and sneaks of the corporations are always in their meetings and report fully everything that is done and every move that is contemplated. Many of their number are ignorant and suspicious and can be easily persuaded that their leaders are designing knaves and getting rich out of the strike, or they can be arrayed against one another, or, worse still, influenced to desert their brethren, return to work, and turn against their former comrades by aiding to defeat them, sink all to the depths of slavery and degradation. Then, again, every violation of law, every criminal act committed during a strike is charged upon the strikers. No matter though they be totally innocent. The press grossly exaggerates every incident that is calculated to prejudice and influence the public, and often lies outright to accomplish this end. Labour, having no press that reaches the great public, must submit in silence. Thus, public sentiment, often brutally ignorant and misdirected, turns upon the struggling, suffering poor, smites them to the earth, and plants its remorseless heels in their emaciated, prostrate bodies. In the great railroad strike of 1894, the riots were incited, the fires were started, and innocent people were shot by the murderous minions of the railroad corporations, but all this was charged upon the strikers, and it lost them the strike and sent them to jail. The proof is simply overwhelming. Only a few days ago, William Bloom, who was arrested at Cleveland, Ohio, for arson, confessed that while serving as a militiaman at Chicago in 1894, during the Pullman strike, he set fire to a grain elevator and more than 50 railroad cars, and that he had committed similar atrocities under similar circumstances at a number of other points. The Necessity of Solidarity Solidarity is one of the principal lessons to miners in the Leadville strike. The engineers, being separately organized and having no immediate grievances, did not act with the miners, and in the course of developments became an important factor in the defeat. Had all been members of one organization, there would have been complete cooperation and the cause of the strikers would have been indefinitely strengthened. The mine managers were not slow to see this opening and take advantage of it. They at once began to commend the organization of engineers for its manly and conservative course, and to cultivate the goodwill of the members with the result that a wide and impassable gulf of hate was created between the miners and the engineers, and the latter became as zealous as the mine managers themselves in opposing the strike and defeating the miners. The shrewd manager has always found a way of dividing workingmen at the critical time when concert of action was required to win the day for labor. This has been all the easier because of the minute division of organized labor. If there is only a corporal's guard engaged in some given occupation and it varies just the slightest from some other occupation, a grand international and independent movement must be at once launched and in this way numberless organizations of every conceivable character have been set afloat, and these are not infrequently in conflict with one another. While disputing about questions of jurisdiction or other trifling matters, the ever-vigilant enemy is at work, and when the hour strikes for action, the corporation is in readiness to the minutest detail, while the workingmen find that from one cause or another they are in no shape for the contest. Then comes defeat, and another turn is given the wheel of oppression, and thus the process goes forward, day by day, while the lot of the toiler becomes steadily harder until he is finally reduced to helpless, hopeless servitude. Again and again has one branch of labor been used to accomplish the defeat of another, and this was a commanding feature of the Leadville strike. And when defeat comes those who were used against their fellow workers are kicked for their thanks. While the strike is on and their services are needed they are flattered and made to believe that they are the chosen people, but as soon as the strike is broken and they are no longer needed, they are treated with scorn and contempt. If they dare complain they are promptly discharged. I have seen this very thing time and time again and could, where it required, cite any number of instances that came under my personal observation. Workingmen may set it down that employers have no use for those who can't be used for tools to do the dirty work, and when men consent to be so used they are certain to receive the reward the cowardly and contemptible conduct invites. The course to pursue to overcome these evils is so plain that scarcely a suggestion is required. Every man of whatever occupation who works about a western mine should be admitted to the Western Federation of Miners. All should be united in one and the same organization.
instead of having men grouped according to occupation and subdivided into various class organizations, each for himself and the devil for the hindmost, I would have them all in one compact organization ready to act together in all things requiring concert of action, the grievance of one being made the grievance of all, and the shibboleth being, each for all and all for each. The miners of Leadville, as elsewhere, should in my judgment adopt at once this plan of organization. Let the past be forgotten, or at least forgiven. To nurse hatred for those who were against us because, largely, the creatures of circumstances can do us no possible good, while the interminable hostility will create still further dissension in the ranks and ultimately disrupt the organization and make broad and smooth and downgrade the road to slavery. A wider scope for the organization, making it possible for all men who work in or about a mine to become members, a more liberal and progressive policy, is among the needs of the miners' union, and I do not doubt these matters will have the earnest and intelligent attention of the delegates to the approaching convention at Salt Lake City. For meantime, every man must do his duty. Defeat in a hard-fought struggle is one of the severest tests to which men are subject. The weak give up in despair and lament about the lost cause. The brave and strong, they who are made of sterner stuff, buckle on their armour and fight again and again till finally victory crowns their cause. The Leadville miners have been temporarily overcome, but they are not vanquished any more than the revolutionary patriots were subdued at Bunker Hill. The Coronado Affair The armed attack on the Coronado mine on the night of September 20th, 1896, was fatal to the interests of the Union and the striking miners and removed all possibility of a settlement of the strike, if indeed any such possibility ever existed. Five from that moment the mine managers were triumphant and the strike was doomed. Had those who made the attack sought to play into the hands of the mine managers, they could not have done so more successfully. The provocation was, doubtless, very great. The Union miners were exasperated in every conceivable manner. Foreign labor was to be imported to take their places and armed toughs taunted and insulted them. Of course, it is not claimed that the miners were entirely innocent. That in some instances they acted with indiscretion goes without saying and that a few of them were guilty of criminal conduct is also admitted. It would be strange, indeed, if under all the excitement incident to a strike of such magnitude there had been no breach of the peace. But after all, the fact stands forth and should be given commanding prominence that as a body, as a union, the strikers were sober, peaceable, and law-abiding, and after the most searching scrutiny, the legislative committee was bound to exonerate them, as an organization, from any culpability for, or in connection with, any crime committed during the strike. It was freely charged that the Coronado affair was instigated by the mine managers themselves. Whether this be true or not, I have no means of knowing and in the absence of proper proof to sustain so grave an allegation, I shall certainly not make the charge. I am bound to admit, however, that from whatever source the attack was inspired, it was a master stroke for the mine managers. For them it mean the protection and support of the militia and the civil power of the state and, if need be, of the nation. The strike was virtually taken off their hands, the state assuming control of the mine owners' interests and arraying all its forces against the strikers. It gave all their enemies the opportunity they longed for to open their batteries on the strike and hold up the strikers to public execration as criminals whose atrocities merited the gibbet. Six the mine managers were furnished by the Coronado incident with a strong pretext to reject all overtures looking to a settlement and they used it to advantage to the very close of the strike. In this connection, the conclusion of the Legislative Committee in reference to the attack on the Coronado is immensely significant. The committee says, on the evening of September 20th, the owners of the Coronado and the Emmett received some intimation that an attack would that night be made at these mines. They did not communicate these rumors to the civil authorities, nor to the Committee of Twenty, and there is no evidence that the union of the Committee of Twenty had any knowledge of any rumored attack, and the owners of the Coronado made no special preparations for defense. Italics Mine. EVD, here we find it in evidence that the mine owners were informed that the Coronado and the Emmett were to be attacked and yet no special preparation was made for defense nor was any report of the intended attack made to the civil authorities. This strikes me, to put it mildly, as having been a most singular proceeding and the conclusion can hardly be avoided that if the mine owners had nothing to do with instigating the attack, they at least did nothing to prevent it and this in face of the fact that they knew it was coming and had ample time to at least make an effort to stop it. Doubtless they foresaw what the effect of it must be and simply let it come.
If the Coronado was not a shrewdly laid trap for the miners, it was at least providential for the mine owners, notwithstanding the deplorable incidents that attended it. It was to the Leeville miners what the sunken road of Ohine was to the French army on the field of Waterloo. 7. I have intimated that even if the unfortunate attack had not been made on the Coronado, it is extremely doubtful if a settlement could have been effected by mutual concession or compromise. The mine managers were not friendly to the Union before the strike, and when it was declared, they avowed their hostility to the organization and determined to disrupt it. Upon this point, there is no room for doubt. Two days after the strike had been declared, on June 22nd, they entered into a written agreement which, among other things, provided as follows, to not recognize or treat in any manner or at any time with any labor organization. This settled the matter. It was, in fact, an agreement not to treat with the miners at all and a declaration of war upon their organization. The miners struck, of course, as an organized body and if they could not negotiate a settlement of the grievance as such, there was nothing left for them but unconditional surrender. This was the central, commanding issue, in fact the only issue, from the day the strike was inaugurated. If the right of workingmen to organize be conceded, and the most implacable foe of labor dare not go before the American public in opposition to this right, can the arbitrary attitude of the mine managers be justified on any reasonable ground? This agreement, not to treat with the miners, for that was the purport and import of the compact, was not prompted by the lawlessness or violence of the strikers, for none had been committed. It was entered into in the very beginning of the strike, he barred the door of conciliation and made unconditional surrender the only possible basis of settlement. This indisputable fact effectually silences the claim of the mine managers that during the early stage of the strike they proposed arbitration as a basis of settlement and that their proposition was rejected by the strikers. The agreement and the alleged proposal to arbitrate are diametrically contradictory to each other and hence the conclusion that the contention of the strikers that no proposal of arbitration was ever made by the mine managers was correct and must be admitted. It is axiomatic that a rule, to be fair, must work both ways. Suppose that the miners immediately upon declaring the strike had entered into an agreement not to recognize or treat in any manner or at any time with any organization of mine managers. And suppose that in spite of all entreaties they had tenaciously adhered to this agreement and insisted upon the unconditional surrender and utter humiliation of the mine managers, even though such a policy meant misery to thousands, the loss of untold property interests, and the irretrievable ruin of the camp. In reviewing the Leadville strike these interrogatories are in order and are well calculated to challenge thought and reflection in the minds of all men who love justice and fair play. The Degradation of Mine Labour in the article preceding this I said that the paramount issue with the mine owners was the disruption of the miners' union. The question of wages could, and doubtless would, have been readily settled. Indeed, it is doubtful if upon this question alone the strike had ever been declared. The only effect of the question of wages was to speedily and thoroughly organize the miners. As soon as the matter of demanding increased wages was raised, men fairly flocked into the union and it is in order to remark that if the increase had been secured, many of them would have been as prompt to flock out again. There are workingmen who never join a union unless they have a personal grievance or want their pay raised and then they rush into a union with a whoop and precipitate a strike and when the strike is over, whether it succeeds or fails, their fit of unionism is ended and they recede as unceremoniously as they appeared. Such men have no conception of union principles and are always a detriment to an organization. They are animated wholly by selfish motives. They do not join a union because they approve its principles or are in sympathy with its mission, or because of a desire to help their fellow men, but simply and solely to use it as emergency may require, to accomplish their own selfish ends. If the union happens to succeed they pocket the benefits but never attend another meeting, nor pay another cent of dues. If failure results, they are the first to pour the denunciations upon the leaders for having sold them out, and to condemn and renounce the union for having beat them out of their jobs. In this, of course, they have a chorus of sympathetic amens from plutocrats and their hirelings and parasites, generally including the press and often the pulpit, who, while feigning to commiserate with the poor, dukes, as they are termed, for having been led astray by designing agitators, proceed to traduce the leaders and misrepresent and vilify the union and thus the organization is made to appear as a reprehensible conspiracy and is riven asunder and the now defenseless employees settle down to their tasks, dismayed and disheartened, while the screws are applied to 
them more vigorously than ever, and with accelerating rapidity they begin the downward course to degradation. I have neither time nor space to elucidate the point, but this is the outline of the process whereby the once independent, self-respecting American workman has been reduced to mendicancy and servitude. The state of Pennsylvania affords a humiliating illustration. The investigation just authorized by the state legislature has disclosed a most shocking state of affairs. Twenty years ago, the coal miners of that state could make from $4 to $1.06 per day. Now at the very best, they cannot average to exceed $1 per day. In many cases, they cannot make more than $0.50, cents, while others are only able to average $0.25 cents per day. What a tragic enactment on American soil, wet with the blood of the world's noblest martyrs, that liberty, equality, and justice might be the heritage of all, and this to gratify the insatiate lust for wealth and power. Is the situation overdrawn? Do I hear it said that such talk is merely the gabble of a walking delegate, the raving of a lying agitator who is trying to stir up discontent? Listen, ye Americans, and especially ye who froth about organized labor and refuse to treat with it. Listen, I say, to what follows, for these workingmen are not organized. Once they were, they took the advice of some of our present-day employers, including certain mine managers. They abjured organized labor and preserved their independence, and relied upon the honor of their employers to do them justice, and this has brought them to the 25 cents per day level, a rate of wages that an average Chinaman would scorn to work for. Here is a brief extract from the report just issued in reference to the legislative investigation. The legislative committee that is investigating the condition of the miners of the Pittsburgh district completed its second day of personal inspection among the mines, and what the investigators witnessed would fill many large volumes. When the work was finished, the members of the committee made the statement that no such suffering was ever known by them to exist before, and they are well convinced that something must be done and at once to alleviate the condition of the unfortunate thousands who are in the district. The territory that was inspected today was in and about Banning on the P and L E Railroad, eight about 40 miles above Pittsburgh. The mines are located at Banning Station and are worked by about 100 miners. One half of that number could easily do the work, for the men do not get more than two or three days a week. When they do work, the cars are so scarce that no matter how hard they try they are unable to make more than one dollar a day at the outside, and very much more frequently their pay for the day is from 25 to 50 cents. The greater part of these employees are foreigners, there being but 10 American-born families in the entire number. After leaving the settlement in and about Banning, the committee went to Jacobs Creek, about three miles below Banning, where the Dar mines of Osborne and Sager are located. The condition of the miners here is worse, if anything, than at the mines owed Banning. The men work from three to four days a week, but the wages they receive are so small that they can scarcely manage to exist. The greater part of the miners are foreigners, with a good sprinkling of Americans and Negroes. The company owns the miserable hovels which shelter the inhabitants. One of the most wretched is a shed about 18 by 12 feet. For this hovel the company received $4 per month and it would cost about $25 to build it. The occupants of the house are Peter Jones, his wife and child, and eight boarders. Where these 11 persons managed to find room enough to stretch out at night is a mystery. Inside there was a varied assortment of furniture, for the cooking, eating, and sleeping is all done in one room. We just managed to live, said Mrs. Jones, but if it was not for the boarders that we keep Peter could not make enough in the mines to keep us from starvation. Here is food for a whole freight train of through and for none more than for western miners. Mine managers can also contemplate this appalling picture at their leisure, and if they are not destitute of heart and soul and conscience, and some, I know, are not, they will not only cease their antagonism to union labor, but will encourage the men to organize and with words of kindness and encouragement do their best to secure and maintain harmonious relations and present a solid front against such Siberiation of the Western states. But aside from all ethical consideration, such a policy of degradation as reduced the once proud state of Pennsylvania to a plague spot is ruinous and destructive. The famishing miner is followed by the bankrupt operator. Read this dispatch which I clip from this morning's paper, Pittsburgh, April 29, 1897. John M. Risher, the big co-operator, has confessed judgment to his wife for the sum of $115,376 on notes given to her at diverse times. Mr. Risher was supposed to be one of the wealthiest operators in the district. 
No reason for the judgment is given except the disastrous condition of the coal business. Here we have an exhibition of the logical consequences of the intolerant, impoverishing policy of crushing labor. Nine, this is the story briefly told, organized capital, organized labor, strike, nothing to arbitrate, riots, soldiers, injunction, labor vanquished, reduced wages, tramps, bankruptcy, general demoralization, and all-around ruin. But fortunately, such calamities are not unmixed evils. They are not only fruitful of lessons to observant men, but they are the means of shaking to their foundation and ultimately destroying old systems and decaying institutions and preparing the way for the new, and thus making possible the material progress and moral development of the world. Mine managers were culpable. There is a chapter in the report of the Legislative Committee under the caption of Mine Managers Blamed, page 38, which I deem it proper to reproduce in full as follows, that the mine managers from the beginning and throughout the entire progress of the strike have shown an unjustifiable antagonism to organized labor in general, that this committee is forced to the conclusion that the proposed agreement prepared and discussed by the mine managers prior to the strike was aimed at the existence of the union in much the same way as the agreement of June 22nd, above set forth, is, that with the the existence of that agreement, which was kept secret until it was produced in the course of the committee's investigations, it is not likely that any agreement or arbitration could have been arrived at before the Coronado affair, even if the union had been less arbitrary in its demands, that a failure to bring about a settlement of the difficulty since the Coronado affair, and up to the present time, is directly traceable to the unwillingness of the mine managers to treat with the union in any way that will recognize its existence, that in considering the terrible outrages committed in Leadville, the injury and financial disaster brought to a number of mine managers by reason of these outrages, and the state of terror and fear of personal violence which a number of the mine managers have suffered during the strike. There is justification on their part for their feeling of bitterness towards the union, but even that does not justify a refusal to deal with any labor organization, that in the opinion of your committee a dissolution of the present union and the organization of a new union would be an idle form, because the new union would no doubt be composed of the same members, and that therefore, if the mine managers will receive from their position not to deal with labor organizations, your committee can see no further practical reason why they should not deal with the present union, and here it is proper to stat that a number of the leading mine managers testified that they had no objection to organized labor, but on the contrary believed it was necessary for the welfare of the laborers and for the state that laborers should organize to protect their interests. The testimony of the mine managers who were examined at the hearing clearly indicated that they hold a large body of the union men in high esteem, and that they would be only too glad to give them employment. It is safe to say that reconciliation between the parties is rife and that it needs but reasonable concessions on both sides to bring it about. This confirms what I have previously said in reference to the disruption of the miners' union having been the paramount issue. For some time the mine owners had seen the tide of organization rising. They viewed it with no little apprehension, for they were shrewd enough to discern in the movement a power that might interfere with their plans and give them trouble. Among them were those imperious, self-willed men who would brook no interference from any source. They had always had their own way, and they had become used to issuing orders and having them implicitly obeyed. They grew furious at the very thought that they were to be dictated to as to how to run their own business, and this is what they construed the purpose of organization to be, they proposed to run their business to suit themselves, and if the wages and conditions were not satisfactory to the men, they might quit, and the sooner this was settled and understood the better for all concerned. This was the general spirit of the mine managers, although there were those who freely conceded the right of their employees to organize and to protect themselves in their rights and wages by all the lawful means that organization could provide. The attitude of the mine managers is shown in the statement of the Legislative Committee that the proposed agreement prepared and discussed by the mine managers prior to the strike was aimed at the existence of the union, and that, from the beginning and throughout the entire progress of the strike, the mine managers have shown an unjustifiable antagonism to organized labor in general, and that, a failure to bring about a settlement of the difficulties since the Coronado affair, and up to the present time, is directly traceable to the unwillingness of the mine managers to treat with the union in any way that will recognize its existence. These are strong words and the responsibility for the long continuance of the strike and its attendant crime and suffering is charged wholly to the policy of the Association of Mine Managers in refusing to recognize or treat with the miners as an organized body. For, says the report, while there is justification on their part for their feeling of bitterness towards the union, even that does not justify a refusal to deal with any labor organization. 
While organized themselves and made secure in their position by united action, they denied the miners the same privilege and refused to recognize or treat with them in that capacity. It is urged that the reason of this was that some of the miners had committed violence and that therefore the union had forfeited the right to be recognized as a law-abiding body. Ah, but the mine managers had taken this attitude before any violence had been committed, indeed, before the strike had been declared, so that this plea cannot be made in extenuation of their implacable hostility to the union. And it was this element in the opposition to the union that engendered most of the bitterness which, as I believe, culminated in the Coronado attack and directly or indirectly led to almost every other breach of the law. As I have previously stated, the miners who declared and carried on the strike were not infallible. That they made mistakes, some of them grave ones, cannot be questioned. In my opinion the most serious of these was in declaring the strike on such short notice, and not allowing the mine managers more time for consideration. Not that this would have prevented the strike, for this seems to have been inevitable and bound to come, but the miners would have been stronger in their position after having given the mine managers ample time and every reasonable opportunity to make the desired concession. That the men acted with undue haste is undoubtedly true, but this is readily understood by those who have attended similar meetings and know how men are swayed under the excitement incident to a recital of the grievances and the refusal of their employers to give them any satisfaction. However, as the purpose is to profit by the mistake of the past I quote as follows from the report, with which I fully agree, your committee believes that whatever the grievance of the miners may have been, the strike should not have been declared without further effort on the part of the union to bring about an adjustment, either by agreement or by arbitration, and that the strike should not have been declared without reasonable notice. The strikes of the past three years have been fraught with great suffering, but it has not been in vain. Although thousands have been forced from their homes a melancholy train to traverse climbs beyond the western main ten the sacrifices have not been useless and some time they will have their compensation. In no other way can humanity reach higher elevations. Our antecedents suffered that we might enjoy and we can only bear testimony of our gratitude by doing something for those who are to come after us. The path forward. It was a year ago this month that the Leeville strike was declared. A world of history has been made since that time. The experience of the Leadville miners in encountering defeat after a long and weary struggle has been shared by hundreds of thousands of other workingmen, representing nearly all the trades known to modern industry. A few years ago, before the days of great combines, labor organizations were frequently able to not only prevent reductions but to secure increases in wages. They had a powerful restraining effect upon those who sought to reduce labor, for an organized strike was at best disastrous and a thing to be avoided. It is different now. The strike is now courted on the least provocation. It gives the corporation little or no inconvenience, for all it has to do is lay back until the government, municipal, state, or federal, as the case may be, suppresses the strike and starves or jails the strikers. Capital has profited by the lessons taught by strikes, just as we want the miners at Leadville and elsewhere to do. The Leadville strike cost the miners in wages lost and in cash contributions about $1.5 million. Think of this vast sum taken from the earnings of a comparatively small body of workingmen for the purchase of idleness and all the woes that follow in its train. I write in no spirit of lamentation or regret. In writing of labor's adversities, croaking is never in order. I simply call attention to certain facts as a basis to certain conclusions. The Leadville strike, if we are stupid and unreasoning, will be a total loss, but if we are wise, it will be worth every dollar it cost many times over. The Leadville miners were as thoroughly organized as it was possible for them to be. They had the solid support of the Western Federation of Miners, the most aggressive and powerful labor organization in the West. They were able to hold their men together, practically without a break, for more than eight months, and yet they were defeated. Could they have won by holding out longer? No. Why? For several reasons. First, the Mine Owners and Managers Association was composed in the main of very rich men and they could afford to wait indefinitely. They had vast holdings elsewhere and whether the mines at Leadville were in operation for a year or two or not did not prevent them from eating three square meals a day. Theirs was simply to wait, and as long as they were enduring no privations, they could afford to do that. The temporary loss thus entailed, whatever that might amount to, is always made good by reductions of wages after the strikers are starved back into submission. 
second at the back or in front of the mine owners of the state militia, the judicial guard, and all the resources of the state, and if this did not suffice, the president of the untied states, the regular army, the navy, and all the organized forces of the national government. C. Organized capital is not only supported by the government, right or wrong, it is the government. They are synonymous terms. Third, the country is swarming with idle men, miners as well as others, many of whom are verging on starvation. These are the product of the capitalistic system of production and they constitute a factor in labor strikes which decrees inevitably the defeat of labor. No labored argument is required to demonstrate that to strike under such conditions is wasteful if not criminal folly. The contest is fearfully uneven. Labor is certain to be beaten and to have to foot the bill besides. What then? Let us reason together. Suppose the miners now had the million and a half dollars the strike cost them, and suppose further that they concluded to go into the mining business themselves. Why not? Who dare say the proposition is not practicable, but it is not required to have so large a sum to begin with. A few thousand dollars would answer. The union could select three good members to supervise affairs and by judicious management, cooperative mining could soon be established and instead of miners working out their lives to enrich a few individuals they would be doing something for themselves. This would not be all there is in cooperative industry, for this, to have the proper results, must be general, but it would end wage slavery among the miners and at the same time be a link stride in the right direction. The wage system is at the foundation of labor's wrongs and these will not be righted until the system is abolished. As long as thousands of workingmen depend for employment upon the assent of an individual, they are in fetters, and the declaration of independence is a falsehood and a mockery. There is no equality of men in such a situation. One is master in all the term implies and the other is slaves. One commands and the others obey, and in these latter days even the opportunity to yield abject obedience has become a precious privilege. This cruel, unnatural system cannot always prevail. Indeed, there are 10,000 evidences that it is even now in the grasp of dissolution. All that is required to send it tottering to its fall, never to rise again, is a little common sense among the common people. That the Leadville miners and the Western miners in general will profit by the lessons taught by the Leadville strike, I do not doubt. Already the voices of the leaders are ringing out clearly in advocacy of more advanced ideas and more progressive policies, and when twelve months more have elapsed, the rank and file, remembering that a few mine owners had sufficient power to defy the governor, the legislature, and the entire Commonwealth of Colorado, will take an inventory of their own resources of intelligence, courage, and independence and resolve to be free men, and thus the Leadville strike will have contributed its full share toward the emancipation of labor. Published in seven installments as Strike Lessons, a dispassionate review of the great struggle in the Western Minor, Volume 1, Number 26, April 10, 1897, PG. 1, Debs on Strikes, Volume 1, Number 27, April 17, 1897, PG. 1, A Solid Phalanx, Volume 1, Number 28, April 28, 1897, PG. 1, Debs Hot Shot, Volume 1. Number 29. May 1st, 1897. P.G. 1. How it is done. Volume. 1. Number 30. May 8, 1897. P.G. 1. Deb's Pain Talk. Volume. 1. Number 31. May 15, 1897. P.G. 1. Lesson of the Great Strike. Volume. 1. Number 34. June 5, 1897. P.G. 1. Copies of all preserved and papers of Eugene the Fifth Debs microfilm edition, Reel 14. One written in seven installments for the Western Miner, official organ of the Cloud City Miners Union No. 33, Western Federation of Miners of America. The first piece was dated Tear Ode, April 5, 1897, with the final installment dated May 31st. Two a special committee was named by the 11th Colorado Legislative Assembly to investigate the circumstances of the Leadville strike. It published its findings as report of the Joint Special Legislative Committee of the 11th General Assembly on the Leadville strike, 1897. Three opening lines of the hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, 1774, by William Cooper, 1731-1800. For reference is the 5th Annual Convention of the Western Federation of Miners, held in Salt Lake City from May 10 to 19, 1897.
The last eight days of the gathering were held in non-public session, which re-elected Edward Boyce of Warner, Idaho, as president. Five at 12.30 a.m. during the night of September 21, 1897, a mob of armed strikers attacked the Coronado Mine, a facility reopened during the Leadville labor stoppage through the use of strikebreakers. A gun battle lasting almost an hour erupted between strikers and armed strikebreakers inside the mine, during which three dynamite bombs were thrown. At 1.45 a.m. an oil tank ruptured and exploded into flames, engulfing the mine buildings and forcing the strikebreakers to retreat. During the battle and its aftermath, three members of the Cloud City Miners Union and a Leadville fireman who refused mob demands not to attempt to put out the fire were killed. The surface structures of the Coronado Mine were completely destroyed. A similar assault was conducted against the Robert Emmett Mine, located about a mile away, although no fatalities resulting from that protracted gun battle. The attacks caused Governor Robert McIntyre to reconsider his previous refusal to accede to mine owners' requests for deployment of the state militia to protect their property interests. The first troops arrived the very next night. Six gallows. Seven, the Schumer Doorn was a deeply sunken lane that bisected the battlefield at Waterloo, which enabled Field Marshal Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, to conceal his forces and entrap and defeat the advancing French army of Napoleon Bonaparte on June 18, 1815. Made the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, established in May 1875. Nine, while the economic condition of coal operators may well have been disastrous in this period, the example Deb cites here is far from prototypical. It involves financial machinations that were part of a dispute among siblings over disposition of the $450,000 estate of co-operator John C. Risher, who died in 1889, leaving his mining operation and various real estate holdings in trust to his children. One of these children, John M. Risher, drew out more than his share from the trust fund, prompting legal action. The John M. Risher Coal Company was liquidated in the summer of 1898, retaining a positive cash balance. Ten couplet from The Traveller, 1764, by Oliver Goldsmith, 1728 to 1774.